Well, greetings out there on YouTube land and welcome to today's big video, which promises to be a real change of pace. It involves the object that is snoozing inside this relatively small box up here on the workshop uh, counter. Uh, so let's get it open, see what it is, and then figure out what we're supposed to do with it. Well, lo and behold, uh, we have what appears to be a virtually brand new uh, Morley Evo 1 uh, delay pedal. Okay, they've also sent a foil replacement for uh, this very famous emblem right here. To be honest, this one's so nice, I can't imagine if, if they sent this uh, to be applied here to replace this. I really think it'd be a shame to do that because this has kind of a nice mellow look. Uh, it looks to be in just beautiful shape. Well, let's get it out of the box. For those of you accustomed to uh, effects pedals that are like the size of a pack of cigarettes, uh, this is unbelievable. This thing is a monster and just as heavy as it looks. If you don't think it's big, compare it to a Vox AC30. I mean, this is a moose. One nice touch, though, is that the groupies will have a hard time concealing this in their undies when they try to fleece you after the concert. So let's take a real close look at it. Uh, this rubber is so perfect, it looks to me like it's been replaced. Um, there is there's some signs of age and corrosion on the chrome finish. We have here the echo speed. We have an adjustment here for a multiple echo limit, echo volume limit, two mysterious switches here that I have no idea what they're for, and we have the instrument and Ampl uh, instrument input, amplifier output, jacks, and just a cooling screen all around the oil can unit. Okay, looks pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm thinking step one, let's remove these uh, four little quarter inch uh, bolts and lift the cover off and see what's lurking inside. Before we proceed with the dissection, let's have a brief historical review of Morley Evo 1 foot pedals. The, the, these were made from 1974 to 1982. The oil can delay unit that's inside was invented by a man named Ray Lubeau. Now, you've heard that name before. Whenever you've heard Tell Ray, he is the Ray in Tell Ray. So Ray Lubeau invented this device and he and his brother Marvin uh, would uh, sell them to other manufacturers like Fender and Gibson to make echo delay units. Uh, after a while they started selling them on their own uh, but under the name of Morley. Their, I thought their logo was really clever. It sounds like something Billy Gibbons would say, if it ain't chrome it ain't got the tone. Okay, now there's a wonderful Premier Guitar article dated October 2011 that goes into great detail about these. I'll put a link in the video description to help you to find it. Okay, now uh, Ray and Marvin sold out uh, their uh, company to Accutronics of uh, Reverb Tank fame in 1989, and then Accutronics uh, either was bought by or became Sound Enhancements Incorporated in Cary, Illinois. Now here's the part that's both flattering and rather interesting. Remember I said that Sound Enhancement Products is the new owner of Morley uh, and they are the people who sent uh, us this unit for restoration. Uh, apparently they have a museum where they want to display it and also I understand that they are considering starting to remanufacture and offer uh, devices like this, like the Morley Evo 1 pedal, uh, for sale. Okay, so uh, we're, like I said, very flattered that they would choose us to do this restoration, and uh, we're going to do our very best for them. One final tidbit is where they got the name Morley. Okay, at the time, the Leslie unit was very popular. So you can have a Leslie, or you can step up and get a far more compact and effective Morley. Before I remove the cover here over the oil can uh, unit, uh, 
I just had to stop for a second. I have seen pictures of um, this um, logo of theirs for years, and I've never seen one in person. But boy, does that say it all about the old uh, hair band days, back when uh, these Morley pedals uh, were at their prime from 74 to 82. Really snazzy. Okay, let's get started on the disassembly. Well, the top cover is off, and this one is actually rather different from the one that I restored, that old uh, organ tone tail ray. It's got a big flywheel, a rather skimpy, like, O-ring belt drive. I can tell you right now that you need a breaker bar to turn it, okay? It's, it's not frozen, but the grease is really uh, congealed, and um, it's going to need a complete disassembly, cleaning, and then uh, reassembly to function. Uh, there's all these weird hieroglyphics here on the oil can itself. I have a feeling the thing has been serviced at some time. Um, I don't know, maybe you can read this. Stokes or uh, 28, maybe that's a secret uh, formula for the uh, Union Carbide Oil, which we happen to have a uh, about three-quarter bottle of here, so we're in good shape. Okay, uh, let's proceed with the disassembly then, because it's obvious to me this has to completely come apart, and also this is what we've been hired to fix. And now that I've turned it up, I notice that a bunch of oil is leaking out from the echo speed knob, probably from the can itself, and I gotta tell you that this oil smells so bad it would probably knock a vulture off of a manure wagon, okay? It's, it's really stout. Uh, when I unpacked it, I smelled something a little strange. Uh, I checked and Jack denied uh, any responsibility, so now I'm glad to see that it was actually the oil here that was leaking. So, uh, foot pedal off, then uh, protective fence off. I had to remove the knob and the felt backing to it, which of course is soaked in that hideous uh, smelling oil. I'm telling you, here, you smell it. It reminds me of like rancid cooking grease from Caligula's Cafe or something. It's really bad news. Okay, enough griping, let's continue. I've got it upside down, removing the bolts, and i got to say, this thing is in immaculate condition. Uh, if you've ever walked across some of the carpeting in the bars that I used to frequent, uh, it's amazing that the bottom of this could have stayed so nice. Okay, uh, really beautiful shape. All right, uh, four more bolts. Okay, I've unsoldered the wires, uh, unbolted the oil can unit, and I've got it out here where we can get a really good close look at it. Got what appears to be a heavy flywheel here that will maintain a uniform rotational speed. We've got a really badly cracked and dried out rubber uh, rim here on the pulley that drives the flywheel. And you can see the motor armature shaft comes out here. It's going to rub against that not so hot uh, rubber drive wheel which will spin and turn and turn the pretty much frozen uh, flywheel. Okay, and also will turn the disc in our oil can. Now the part that I'm not thrilled about is apparently, I don't know what happened here on this end of the can, but somebody has gone in and put what appears to be epoxy, silicone sealer, all kinds of gunk all over this part of the lid, okay? And I, I can't imagine why it needed to spread out this far. This, I think, is going to be uh, a major problem for us because the oil has to remain inside, especially when it's shipped back to the Morley people. Um, you don't want it uh, riding on it with this side down, all the oil leaking out, which would undo all the repair work. So uh, we're going to have to pop the can, see what, what's done here, and see if we can't do it better. Okay, everything else looks pretty straightforward. Uh, filthy, but straightforward. Okay, a little corroded. Uh, it's a mess. But that's what it's here for. When you see a notch like that in an arm, you figure it's to hold a spring, but a spring in that position would make no sense because that would pull the drive wheel away from the motor armature. 
Okay, um, I think our work's cut out for us here. So let's get started on the disassembly then. You know, I was looking at the pedal to see how does it work because it doesn't appear to have any connection with the unit. It's like the magician here showing you there's no wires. But there's a a uh, threaded shaft right here. It's probably adjustable. I have a feeling it's going to a potentiometer, but uh, we'll open this up, never fear, and we will uh, see all of the secrets, okay, in the morally evil one before we're through. Whatever's lurking in there. But it looks like it has a, a power indicator light, and it also explains these switches. It's either stereo or monaural, and this one over here is either echo or volume, and I'm assuming that means you have a choice of echo or boost. Okay, and by stepping on this switch, which hopefully works, you can have your choice. Then I have a feeling that the amount of pressure you put on the pedal will probably put these selections into action. Okay, very interesting. I've never seen one of these before in person. Uh, maybe you all have, but uh, it's a new experience for me, so I'm like a kid in a candy store, uh, really relishing uh, all the new discoveries. Well, I got the big flywheel off, and you can see where it's been balanced inside. Okay, just like balancing a tire. Very clever. It shows attention to detail. I'm impressed. Okay, let's set this aside, and we'll continue with our disassembly. Okay, now I'm going to test the motor, since uh, it seems to be free and easy to turn. Oh yeah, watch it. Nice and quiet. Well, that's a nice touch. That helps. Let me check and see how the idler wheel here is held. Pretty simple. Uh, a nut on either side and a lock nut to maintain um, some space in between the two larger nuts so that this can move freely. You can see all the cracks in that drive wheel. That may be an issue. We'll see. This O-ring is, is awful puny. It's like licorice spaghetti. Okay, just It's hard to believe that can spin that big uh, flywheel. We'll see. If not, I'll get a proper O-ring uh, that can. The shaft here that goes in and drives the oil can is just frozen solid. When the flywheel was on, I had enough leverage, but uh, that that's where the problem lies. These bushings will have to be cleaned out and the shaft have, will have to be polished. Okay, so uh, now it's going to be a real joy trying to get them uh, get this shaft out of here. Okay, that idler wheel is off and uh, that rubber is really dry. I'm going to try something. It's going to sound really strange, but I'm going to try soaking it in brake fluid. Okay, brake fluid is one of the best things in the world for rubber to soften it and preserve it. Uh, let's see if that helps. Uh, I'm really nervous because, look, that crack looks like it goes all the way through. Like this whole thing's just about ready to separate from the pulley. Okay, I might have to uh, start uh, digging through drawers and all uh, for some kind of replacement rubber wheel. I found a piece of tape inside. Looks like eight. 10, 77, 8, 12, something. I'm guessing that means it was made in 1977 between, um, what's that, August 10th and August 12th. Okay, kind of an informal way of, of uh, marking it, but uh, cute nonetheless. Well, with the through bolts removed, I'm able to take out these pipe spacers. Okay, now we have to get the two at the bottom, and this front plate should be ready to come off. All right, I've got the motor plate pulled away, and we can get a good look at the motor. I've cleaned all the dirt and dust and everything off of it. You uh, can read what model it is. If you need one, this might be helpful. Um, also, there is that tape, you see. Might be August... No, that's August 10th, 77, August 12th, and I can't read what's on the right side. But, it's coming apart nicely. Uh, bushings don't seem excessively worn. Okay, let's keep going now, and uh, we'll get that oil can separated, 
and see if we can't get the can open and get a look at the all-important anodized aluminum disc. You know, I was looking uh, in my uh, vintage guitar uh, price guide. It's an older one. It's several years old. And it shows these things at like $200. Okay, then I check eBay and they're $1,200. So apparently uh, you had been wise to invest your money in Morley Evo 1 um, Echo pedals uh, back a few years ago because they certainly have gone up sixfold in value. Okay, we're down now to uh, one uh, vertical panel and the floor, uh, it's all one piece, and the oil can itself. You can see that the shaft that turns the anodized disc is coming through this kind of protruding bushing. It seems kind of odd, but that's the one that's frozen solid. So I'm going to have to loosen it up somehow to where this shaft will slide through that bushing so that I can get the aluminum disc out of the oil can. All right, I've got the shaft to rotate. Uh, it's still pretty snug, but I'm seeing what our problem is here on uh, this outside uh, end of the can. The bushing that this travels through has been glued to the can. You know, that's not going to work. Okay, that's where all the leaking is taking place. I'm going to have to get all of this garbage off of the can. First, I'm going to pull the lid off, okay? I'm going to pry the lid, just like you would any uh, lid on a paint can, very gently so you don't deform it. But we're going to try to pop this lid off, and with it will come this loose and wretchedly uh, glued uh, bushing. Okay, then we'll get a chance to see what the damage is to the can and whether or not I'll be able to fix it. Okay, and we're going to go around and just very gently pry upward oh, about every three quarters of an inch or so around and make very slow and hopefully steady progress. That, I just heard it pop I think. There we go. Okay. Well, it's still stuck. Okay, here it is. Ugh. And you see the mess that they made in here for reasons unknown. So uh, let me scrape all this garbage off of here. You see that the bushing that protruded was actually an internal part in the unit, okay, which is loose. I don't get it, okay. I, to me, this bushing should be attached to the can lid. Well, we'll see. It's glue. It's what a what a disaster. And the oil's all leaked out. And here, take a sniff. Boy, wow. Okay, not not good. I'm not going to be dabbing any behind my ears. Okay, for my big date on Saturday. Well, I'm trying to pry up this hideous mess here. It's like trying to take Lon Chaney's face off. Okay, it's uh. It's a disaster, uh, but I bet I can fix it, okay? I've been uh, w working on the hot rods and doing a whole lot of metal fabrication, and I'm thinking there's got to be, be a way to fix this, okay? This is nothing compared to some of the challenges you'll find trying to build uh, car suspensions, okay? Well, I have a clue about what's going on with this big opening in the can lid here. Down at the base of this threaded tube, there were two of these nuts, okay? I have a feeling that one should go inside the can lid and the other should go on the outside, pressing down on something that will seal the can lid around this threaded shaft. This internal shaft here is frozen within the threaded shaft, so it'll have to be freed up. But this, uh, there is a knob that screws to this shaft and it rotates and it, I think it's going to control the amount of delay by moving the right head uh, further away from the reed head or vice versa. Okay, so we'll see. But anyway, uh, it's starting to make more sense the further I get into this. Now is the part that's, uh, to me, a little counterintuitive. 
Uh, this is like the ship in the bottle. You would think you'd remove like these two nuts and pull this whole thing out, but such is not the case. Uh, what you have to do is go around back here and pry the back lid off so that the surrounding part of the can can come off and you can get to the nuts and bolts that you need to release everything. So now I'm going to repeat the same process that I did uh, trying to pop the front cover off and we're going to go around the back and release the outer rim here of the can. Well the outer rim of the can came off uh, fairly well. It took about five minutes of careful prying. It also looks like somebody has used some of that all a bunch of that white glue here to try to uh, keep the oil from leaking out of the can which it really shouldn't do if the can itself seals properly. You can see a whole bunch of this. I'm not sure why it's in here. Okay, uh, but anyway, um, everything's been slathered with that glue. So, uh, here we've gotten to the point where you can see the adjuster that moves the heads for uh, the duration of echo. Uh, see everything's rusted and corroded. It's a mess, and they always are. But what's important is the disc itself appears to be in good shape. We've got a new visitor in the backyard, a state bird of New Mexico, a good-sized roadrunner. He's been hanging around now for about two or three weeks, and I think he's eating uh, some of the cat food we put out for the feral cats. Sorry how unsteady this is, but it's on a micro lens. There he goes. Ah, spectacular. Good boy, I guess. <laughs> I think I solved the problem with the echo speed knob. The person who worked on this before just assumed that the shaft and the housing were all one piece and just let this be free to thrash around here uh, and then slathered a silicone sealer all over to try to keep the oil in the can. The reality is that the shaft has seized onto the housing so I'm going to have to disassemble the basket you see there's four, uh, two screws on either side and then try to extract the shaft from the housing which won't be easy uh, clean the exterior of this, the interior of this, and get it to where the shaft can move the reed head freely across the disc. Okay, then once this is stabilized against uh, the uh, front of the uh, cage unit, uh, where it protrudes through the hole, I can put a nut on the inside and on the outside with a seal of some sort to try to keep the oil in the can. Um, he was trying to seal a moving housing. I will be trying to seal a stationary housing and I believe that's going to be a whole lot easier to do. To do. Alright, I removed those four quarter inch uh, little bolts on either side and now the outside part of the cage is loose and I can lift this arm out of here with the housing and the shaft. Now this arm hangs on to this mobile head here and by rotating the position of the head you can either increase or decrease the duration uh, of the echo. In other words the distance between when you hear the first sound and the second sound. The closer the reed head is to the right head the shorter will be the echo and then the further you move it away from the right head the longer will be the uh, space before the echo. So let's get this out of here and see if we can't free up the housing and the shaft. Okay, as you can see the shaft comes from out here, comes through the housing and then is connected to this sheet metal arm. Now the hard part of this is I have to be able to grab this so that I can turn kind of rotate and remove the shaft and it's threaded and anytime you try to grab something with a pliers as I gently did earlier you can see the marks 
you a risk damaging the threads permanently. So I'm going to use heat and uh, some sort of soft jawed method of holding the threaded uh, housing. Uh, but I need to push this shaft through and liberate it and the arm from this housing. Well, with the help of two fusion reactors, a six foot crowbar and words that I didn't know I knew, um, I got the housing off with minimum destruction to the threads. Now it's time to polish the shaft here and clean out the interior uh, diameter of the housing so that this can pass through here and rotate easily. Okay, everything's cleaned up and lubricated and there's a little bit of resistance which is what you want so that it will hold that uh, mobile head in place but you can see it does turn freely. Now with this out of the way I was able to remove the uh, mobile head here, of the reed head, the anodized disc which has some stains but I don't think it's scratched. Okay, it's, uh, you have to be really careful when you clean this to not use anything even slightly abrasive. Okay, it's the most fragile part, so I'm going to set it down here out of harm's way. And then we've got the uh, inner part here of the can, and you can see where somebody has gone nuts with some sort of sealer trying to keep the oil in the can. And um, it's a mess. Okay, so I'm going to have to thoroughly clean these parts. Take a look at this, this, and this, and I'll be back in just a minute with them cleaned up. Oh, and also, how about that horrible old rusty inside of the can, and we'll see what we can do uh, with those parts. And now for the final part, here's the before, and here's the after, nice and clean. Here's that filthy rusty can all cleaned out. I left the coating on the outside uh, so it would look more original. Um, that motor plate all cleaned up. Here's that black glob of muck that was I guess an oil seal to keep the oil from uh, escaping out that shaft. Here is the outer lid Okay, here's the the right and erase heads and the mobile reading head. Okay, nice and clean and now I'm going to wash them in a detergent to get any residual oil and uh, glass beads off of them and then uh, we'll be ready to start a reassembly. The next step is to wash all the parts in a fairly strong detergent solution. Now those parts looked really clean but look how dirty that water is. Here they are. Now I'm going to rinse them with uh, sort of a high pressure spray of water and then blow dry them with about uh, 80 psi of compressed air. Okay here are all those really grungy parts all scrubbed and dried and blown dry. Every crevice and cranny has been cleaned out uh, very carefully and now it's time to begin reassembly. And here is the all-important anodized disc uh, carefully cleaned uh, by hand. As you can see uh, there's a couple stains on the surface I think from the uh, little rubber heads touching it over a period of, you know, like 900 years. But uh, it's got that kind of a rainbow ref uh, refraction that you look for in these, and it looks to me like it's going to be a really good anodized disc. First step on reassembly is I had to check this bushing, and, you know, it's pushed way out here, and I that didn't seem right. So if you push it back in, then use the little spring-loaded clip back here to hold it flush instead of protruding I think it would tend to leak a lot less so I'm going to reinstall the bushing properly. Before I push the bushing in flush I 
applied some uh, oil proof high temperature black silicone sealer around the perimeter then when I push the bushing in flush it will seal and prevent the oil from leaking around the outside diameter of the bushing. All right, the bushing's in place. That spring retainer has been pushed down to hold it flush on the uh, can side of the uh, motor plate here. And you can see that thin bead of the uh, silicone sealer all the way around the bushing. And I think that's got to be a whole lot better than that pillowcase full of molten tar that was in here. Next, I cut a short piece of neoprene hose a little bit taller than those two uh, phenolic spacers so that when I screw this down on here the uh, hose will seal at the bottom aided by some black silicone and up at the top. Now with that piece of hose pushed all the way down and seated uh, with the silicone sealer all the way around it I've got the little phenolic spacers in position. We're going to set this on top and then screw it down with the original screws which have to be cleaned before they can be used. Alright I'm ready to uh, install this bottom bracket and I have put a coating of the black silicone sealer on the top and bottom of the spacers and on the top of that neoprene hose so now when I put the, the uh, brace across it will seal tightly so that oil cannot get past the spacers or the neoprene hose. Alright there you have it with the spacers on either side sealed top and bottom neoprene in the middle both compression sealed and uh, with the silicone and the nuts tightened down here on the outside so it appears that uh, this much of the assembly is complete and there's only one possible exit for the oil on this side of the can and that is uh, through that the shaft that drives the anodized wheel as it passes through the bushing um, and I'm thinking I'll put like a little felt washer or something in here that will soak up the oil and sort of prevent it from passing through I also went back and coated each of the bolt heads with the black silicone sealer so that no oil could leak uh, under them and down their shafts and contaminate the little motor uh, compartment back here. I'm going to set this piece aside to let that black silicone harden overnight and it's time now to start on the read, write, and erase disc. And I've already installed the bushing that originally was seized to the shaft that went through it. Now it's uh, freed up and I have installed it very securely with a nut here passing through the disc and one of its supports. Well it's time for another update on the status of Ollie the rescued feral cat. Um, she's taken over a carpeted cat house that I made several years ago and lives in there quite happily. Uh, she has her food and water down here at the base and her own heater. Sadly Jack and Casey have decided to file suit with the ASPCA um, demanding their own carpeted cat house and catered meals and heater. Okay more to follow. Alright that control arm that moves the reed head back and forth on the disc has been inserted through the uh, threaded housing that is now securely bolted down to the frame as it should have been all along and we see that we can rotate the shaft and move that reed head easily. Uh, the knob will fit on here and uh, that will allow us to control the amount of delay that occurs in the unit. The shaft is held in place by a tiny little horseshoe shaped spring keeper right here that goes into a groove on the shaft and keeps the shaft from going back through to the inside of the unit, okay, holding it tightly in place. I've added the vertical steel support under the nut holding the uh, threaded housing. So now this unit is finished and we have to uh, now uh, prepare the other half 
of the uh, unit that's going to fit in here and bolt to these arms. And to do that, we will install the shaft with the anodized disc. Through the bushing, I have lubricated this so that the disc spins freely with no end play to speak of. Okay, that's step one. Next, I have to prepare the little rubber record, erase, and read heads and coat them in a layer of the Union Carbide special oil. Uh, we don't want them to be dry against the disc because they might abrade it. Okay, so we'll apply and also this is cleaning the disc. You see how some of the black comes off. Okay, we really have to take care of that anodized disc because that's the key to the whole device and no one knows how to remake them. Okay, next I'll set the movable reed head down on the uh, snout, the snout of the shaft that holds the anodized disc and then we're going to press this piece down on it with the spring there against the reed head holding it in position and uh, reinstall the four screws that hold it all together. Now the top and bottom brackets are reunited and held with the four cap screws. Um, as you can see uh, over here we're going to have the uh, right head. This I believe is the erase and this over here is going to be the reed head and as we've been saying it now can be adjusted for less or more distance between it and the record head which in so doing will increase or reduce the delay that the unit creates. And we can see that the disc will spin freely underneath the three heads when it is driven by the motor unit with the big flywheel out here and the rubber idler wheel which is yet to be reconstructed. Now wires from the record and reed head are soldered to their respective terminals uh, to allow external access to them once the uh, can is sealed up. It's also important that the wires be clear of the edge of that spinning disc so that the uh, disc doesn't cut through the insulation and short out the signal. Now it's time to reinstall the can over the unit and uh, seal it completely down here around the rim. I'm going to apply a thin layer of silicone sealer to this edge all the way around here halfway uh, as a lubricant to assist in the sliding of the can down over the metal and also to form a seal if there's any little tiny crevices left between this and the edge here of the tin can hopefully it will seal them. Now the can is securely pressed down on the lid. I used a C-clamp all the way around to make sure that it was down flush with the uh, metal uh, the motor board there and then I double checked to make sure that the wires were not touching the wheel inside. I also put the seam of the can at the top thinking that with the oil at the bottom uh, if there are any leaks here, at least uh, this seam would not be submerged in oil while the device was in operation. All right, I installed the motor, the outer motor plate, flywheel, and that idler wheel, the rubber was just simply too dry, too hard, and it just slipped. Okay, the armature here from the motor couldn't drive it. So I installed a really fat o-ring that gave the proper outside diameter it's also nice soft neoprene rubber so it has good uh, good coefficient of friction with the armature and as you can see we get a nice smooth rotation of our flywheel and our disc inside the unit I'm gonna let it run for a while just to uh, sort of spread the lubrication around, wear off any rough spots, 
and uh, then I think uh, we're ready to uh, reinstall this motor back into the pedal unit and uh, I'll also have to check the electronics in it and uh, we may end up uh, being able to test this pretty soon so stay tuned well it looks like we've got uh, a really good smooth action here um, it comes up to speed quickly when you start the motor uh, the flywheel maintains an even rotational speed now I believe that this part is finished I have not yet added the oil or installed the lid on the can that's the final step okay so we'll do that in just a second and then we'll fabricate some sort of an oil seal to keep the oil in the can so that it can't come down uh, the threaded uh, housing here like uh, it could before now it's time to pour the magical mystery oil into our tin can uh, it is a union carbide product called LB65 uh, it's just a very thin type of oil uh, material I'm sure it has other properties uh, that I'm not privy to you only put in a very tiny amount now if you notice the whole mechanism is off center in the can so that the anodized disc passes probably within about an eighth or three sixteenths of an inch from the bottom of the can so you only want just a small amount in there so that the rim of the disc will pick it up and then the oil will pass over the surface be spread by that uh, really wide heavy uh, rubber head and will uh, provide the uh, type of memory storage on the surface of the disc it's necessary then for us to uh, write and then read our musical signal so I'll just pour in just a small amount run it and make sure that the disc remains covered with oil and then we're ready to seal the outside of the can let's take a few moments to discuss how the reading and writing of the music signal is accomplished and uh, discuss the purpose of the uh, special uh, Union Carbide Oil. Uh, this is the anodized disc here and we'll say that the rotation is counterclockwise. We've got three rubber heads and they're just a piece of flap of rubber, black rubber like in an inner tube. The music signal is going to be sent in to the right head. The read head will send a signal out to the amp, the signal that it reads from the surface of the disc and then the signal will come around here and the erase head uh, which is grounded will partially erase the signal but every time it comes around we'll get an echo okay and the echo will diminish the first time from the right head to the read head will be a very strong signal partial erasure come around weaker signal partial erasure weaker, weaker again and until the echo finally fades out. Meanwhile, the right head is adding more music signal to the disc. And because in this particular unit, the read head is motile, it can be moved uh, closer to the right head for a very short delay or much further away from the right head for a much longer delay. Now let's look at a sort of a cross section of the disc. Okay, it's laying down uh, perpendicular to the camera. We see the aluminum disc here, which is just really a carrier uh, for the anodized layer that is put on it electrostatically. Now, whatever this anodized layer is, it's uh, something that can be statically charged easily and the static charge can be removed easily so uh, the signal then will be uh, put into the anodized layer via the deposition of a static charge the problem though is is that static charge will dissipate out into the air very rapidly so we add an oil layer over the surface of the anodized layer to prevent the electrostatic signal from from leaving the anodized layer so uh, the oil then is more like a sealant to preserve the signal in the anodized layer as the disc rotates and as our echoing effect occurs 
Now the big erase head seen here from a di different angle than that first diagram, as you can see it's going to squeegee and put the oil at a uniform thickness in the area where the heads are reading and writing, which is out here more on the uh, perimeter of the disc. And um, this then will, will serve two purposes. Not only does it uh, squeegee the oil, but it also uh, diminishes the signal that's being stored down here in the anodized layer. Now a lot of this is just supposition on my part. I've read some articles about this, but to be honest, uh, the one thing that no one understands completely, including the Morley people themselves, is how to create the anodized layer on the disc. We've got the oil, we got the disc, but it's the anodized layer that is the limiting factor. Right, the level of oil in the can is about midway between the bottom here and the bottom of the can itself. Okay, just enough for the rim to pick it up and then for the black rubber, uh, I believe erase head, to spread it over the disc in a nice smooth uh, thin layer. So now before I put the cover on, I'm very tempted to try to test the unit with the electronics uh, to see if it works and maybe it needs to have a little more oil added or some removed but rather than seal it all up and hope for the best I'm gonna leave it like this uh, until I can get the electronics sorted out and then we'll hook it up and see if it works properly well let's see we're starting here with the pedal unit I think I'm gonna clean this is like the drip pan for the uh, motor unit, so I'm going to clean that up just to make it a little more presentable. Well, there we have it. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's a whole lot better than when I started, which is more than I can say about the paper towel I used to clean it up. Okay, now let's try to gain access here to the electronics unit. Um, there's a couple screws underneath that are really hard to get to, and uh, I'm going to find a way, probably grind down a socket a little bit, find a way to uh, remove them and then we'll take a look at what I think is going to be uh, transistorized um, internal electronics. The floor pan is off and sure enough a good size printed circuit board Telray Electronics Evo 1 okay with all sorts of bizarre little components. I do intend to install a three-wire power cord. I'm also going to check these electrolytics, but I think you all know my stance on working on transistorized uh, pr printed circuit board. You know, ever since I saw this thing, I was wondering what the threaded rod from the foot pedal operated. I assumed it was either a rheostat or some sort of potentiometer, but no, it's a curved piece of like a black rubberized fabric and I couldn't figure for the life of me how can that have any electronic effect then I noticed there's three photoresistors there's one up close one in between and then one far away and they're positioned very carefully now watch what happens when I step on the foot pedal first I'm going to cover the face of the first photoresistor second and third, we're blacking them out then, okay, we're, we're essentially shutting off any light to them, okay, and then we can go uh, reverse that. Uh, so just like the photoresistors in the uh, tremolo circuits and the larger fender amps, this unit uses photoresistors, but in a strange way in that it actually has a mechanical blanket that it puts over them in, in uh, sequence and apparently that will alter the um, the volume of the boost or of the echo delay effect. In this position the uh, three uh, little photoresistors are exposed and you'll get maximum volume when you push down on the pedal like this uh, it covers the resistors and shuts the volume down to zero. And if you're wondering what sort of light 
uh, would this this blanket be uh, shielding the photoresistors from inside a sealed box I have a feeling it's the indicator light right here that tells you if the unit's on or not this is going to fill the whole interior here with bright light which the uh, rolling blanket is going to be able to block from the photoresistors while installing the ground wire for the three wire power cord I made a very interesting discovery. I moved this shielded cable. Look at, this is the, sh the uh, central signal wire. It's not soldered to anything. It's broken loose. Apparently, maybe by me opening the unit or sometime in the past. But I probably would have never noticed that otherwise. So I'm going to have to strip this back and re-solder it. I think I found a design flaw that I bet has occurred in other units like this. The signal wire is like about three human hairs okay tiny just microscopic and yet the shielded cable itself is really strong I mean it's almost hard to bend it's like coat hanger wire so those little wires stand no chance when you start flexing this shield okay so what I did is I tied it here to a solid object so that it would have a strain relief and uh, would stand a chance of remaining soldered while I work on this and then close it back up. Well I've brought in the Morley box for the traditional CAT scan from Jack. He's now investigating the packing material, giving it the once over. I have to be sure that this box and uh, the packing material uh, passes muster before I pack the Evo 1 up to send back. What do you think Jackie? See how thorough he is? Looks to me like everything's okay. I haven't heard any sneezing or howling. Looks like a positive scan to me. Let's look at the tail. Jack? No, I don't know. That tail's neutral. Oh, he winked. That's it. 100%. Boy, see that a double wink? Even better. Okay, the box passes the CAT scan. All right, I've installed the three wire power cord and it uh, grounds the chassis. Um, I've tried to bundle the wires here. This is really very uh, sensitive because all of the wires have to pass through this ungrommeted hole and they're very stiff. Okay, so I've tried to bundle all the wires that don't pass through the hole down here to get them out of the way. Um, next, I'll have to test these capacitors. Uh, you might wonder why I don't just change them all. Well, look at the values on this. How about uh, 470 microfarads at 35 volts? That's the problem with uh, transistorized circuits. Is they're just the opposite of tube circuits. Extremely high capacitance and very low voltage whereas with tube circuits we're used to fairly low capacitance and very high voltage I just don't have these caps on hand so um, hopefully they'll they'll work uh, so that we'll be able to test this unit let's perform our first audio test of the unit the cover is still off of the can so that I can add or remove oil if necessary I plug the guitar into the instrument jack and I plugged a Fender Champ into the amplifier output jack. Now bear in mind there's another quarter inch jack here and there's two buttons here that control things. Right now the way it's set is it's strictly guitar in here, out here, and through the pedal volume control. So listen <laughs> No attenuation at all of the guitar signal, but now let's try the pedal. So in this configuration, this is sort of just like you're playing the guitar plugged in directly into the champ, but you do have this uh, foot pedal that will help you control your overall volume. Okay, now I have uh, left the guitar plugged into the instrument input, 
but I had changed uh, my amplifier from being plugged into the regular amp jack over here to the stereo echo amplifier. Now this unit, this is an unusual one in that it puts out a stereo signal. It puts out the unaltered signal that you just heard, plus it puts out the uh, signal that's been through the oil can that has delay, echo, and chorus added. Now listen to what this sounds like. <laughs> Sort of like an organ, actually, but with echo. Okay, now let's put them both together. Now here's where things are really going to get interesting. I plugged a second amplifier into the amp output jack. I've left the Fender Champ plugged in to the stereo echo output. So now we're going to get a true stereo effect. On the left, the unaltered uh, guitar signal. On the right, the uh, signal that has been altered with echo, delay, and chorus. And I can adjust the relative strength of the left or right channel with the volume controls on the amplifiers. If you don't want the spatial distancing effect of two separate amps, you can simply uh, plug this into channel 1 and this into channel 2 of the same amp and then the signals will mix and come out through the uh, cabinet speaker. But I can tell you that with the two separate amps spaced apart the effect is just incredible. It's much like with a Leslie where the sound comes at you from all different directions. It just sort of floats in the air over your head. It's really special. Okay, I hope the camera microphone, which is stereo, can um, capture this. Okay, so I'm going to just play a few chords and see what you think. that came through okay for you all because here it's it is absolutely beautiful And in this configuration, the pedal controls the right channel or the effect. Hear how flat it gets when you uh, eliminate the effect? Well, as far as I can tell, this thing works perfectly. I can't imagine it working any better. So now it's time to put the lid on the can and uh, get it all back reassembled. Uh, wake up Ollie and Jack and uh, give them a few snorts of catnip and get them to play a few tunes for you in our final audio demonstration. Alright, it's time to permanently install the outer lid on the um, can unit and I put a thin layer of silicone sealer all the way around the inside of the lip so that uh, for two reasons as I said before to lubricate it to allow it to slide uh, and seat completely 
and also hopefully to provide a, a seal if there's any little tiny uh, nooks or crannies left after it's installed. All right, I've pressed the lid just very gently into place, making sure that the hole in the lid is concentric with the threaded housing of that uh, delay control shaft. Then using C-clamps all the way around, I'm going to very gently and uniformly push the lid in, uh, hopefully so that it will seal. All right, the can uh, lid is seated in as far as it'll go all the way around. Now it's time to seal the hole around that uh, threaded housing. And I'm going to use a washer that is the same size on the inside as the outer diameter of the shaft. And uh, I'm going to seal it to the lid. And then I will seal where the nut pushes down on it. All right, I have a bead of silicone sealer around the perimeter of the hole. Then I'll just drop this washer in place, which of course it's fighting me tooth and nail. Drop it down in place here. Press it into the silicone sealer. Wipe off the excess. And then repeat the process here uh, at the interface between the washer and the nut. So now we have the washer sealed against the metal lid and the nut sealed against both the threaded shaft and the washer itself. Now God knows the oil can probably still come down this shaft uh, between the shaft and the housing but I don't think much of it's going to be able to escape in that way so I think it's pretty well sealed up. Well since the preliminary audio test was so favorable decided to go ahead and do the final assembly on the unit. I've installed the protective fence that keeps children and small pets out of the mechanism while it's operating. I also uh, came up with another idea to stop the oil flow down the shaft inside the bushing. I put a O-ring right around that interface and then when the knob is installed and pushed down against it, I think that should be a good final seal. Also, I couldn't resist polishing the chrome, and it just turned out beautiful. It looks very much like new. I went over it with a fine steel wool and then with a chrome polish. Also, I didn't mention this before, but uh, this handle here is so that you can carry the unit with one hand uh, instead of having to use two to hold it on either side, which is a nice touch. And something I didn't discuss during that preliminary audio test is uh, the position of these two adjustment knobs. Now this one right here is the volume of the effect that comes out of this echo output jack and I found that I always wanted it to be maximum. Okay then I could control the blend with the individual volume controls on the two separate amplifiers. The other one is the uh, multiple echo limit and I found that when it was all in uh, one direction um, it didn't quite sound as good in either extreme as it did uh, balanced. So what you uh, heard and will hear again in the final audio demonstration will be a balanced position on this and wide open on the echo volume. Also on the fast and slow delay um, I actually found that uh, going with the uh, fast position where the uh, echo uh, happens rather quickly uh, worked. It sounded a little better than when you delay the echo. It almost, uh, when it's delayed enough, started to interfere with the, the initial um, music uh, signal. So uh, I tended to go to a faster echo speed, as you will hear on the uh, final audio demonstration. So here's the final unit all polished up and assembled with that famous Morley logo plate on top. Now uh, let's set up for our audio demonstration. Here's our setup for the final audio demonstration. On the left we have a late 40s magnetone amp with the SM57 aimed at the speaker. On the right, we have the same vintage, late 40s, uh, Kalamazoo amp with the SM58 aimed at its speaker. I'll have Ollie and Jack play uh, six or eight tunes, and we'll make a digital recording 
in stereo with the left channel being the unaltered uh, guitar signal and the right channel being the Evo 1 effect. Okay, so when they combine in your earphones or on your stereo speakers, you'll be able to hear a true stereo representation of what this effect sounds like uh, when it is operated in the stereo output mode. And as a special added feature, I will push down on the pedal to silence the effect during the last two tunes. Then after a second or two, I will step back on the top of the pedal and reinstate uh, the uh, effect. So you'll be able to hear without and with uh, a couple, two or three times in the last two tunes to make a real direct uh, comparison. So enough gabbing, uh, let's get started.
Well, that's about it for this video featuring the restoration of the 1977 Morley Evo 1 a delay and echo pedal. I'll now box it up and return it to the Morley company uh, so that they can include it in their museum or use it for demonstrations like at NOM shows or as a uh, sort of a prototype if they choose to start reproducing uh, electromechanical effects like this. I want to take my usual a few moments here to thank my Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors for keeping us on the air and advertising free uh, for another month. If you would like to join them, I will leave links in the video description to assist you to do so. Also, I'll place a link in the video description so uh, to help you find the article in Vintage Guitar that talks about the history uh, of the Morley Evo 1 pedal. And now after such a long technical video, I think it only makes sense to have a very untechnical uh, second feature. So with that in mind, uh, please stay tuned and see what you think. You can see how emaciated this cat is. Although her stomach is fat with food up here, you can see there is no, no meat here, no substance to this poor kitty. She's starving to death. Her spinal uh, vertebrae are protruding through her back. Poor little tail's kind of shredded. She has a scar on the back of one of her rear legs from being bitten, I guess. And one of her ears has been bitten. But boy, does she eat. I think in just a short period of time, she'll be a fat, healthy, happy kitty. In an unusual change of pace, Casey is asked to go outside, which she hasn't asked to do in about, I don't know, the two years or so since we rescued her and brought her indoors. This is the port she lived on for quite a few months while she still lived outside uh, and we took care of her and fed her and got her back into good health. Every day I'd sit out here on this glider and talk to her and keep her company when she was living outside. Uh, let's see if she gets back up on my knee again to get her little back scratched. No, nope, looks like she's escaping. Lots of tail wagging. That's a good sign. Oh, neighbor just made a noise. Time for a little gate sniffing. One of my favorite hobbies. She's probably checking up on all the visitors to her front yard, which includes foxes, feral cats, raccoons, and skunks. And also an occasional door-to-door -door salesman. And one thing you can be sure of is each and every one of them paused long enough to spray the gate. Oops, I better go catch up. Well, now she's checking out the courtyard in front of the workshop and hot rod garage. Hey Casey. Now headed back to the front, which sounds sort of contradictory, of the workshop. Uh-oh, aiming for the backyard, and that's where Tennessee Tuxedo lives, and he's not very friendly to strangers, so I better go rescue her. This is the first time she's been in grass in a long time. And uh, this is our sort of a grapevine encrusted dog run. And we have a fox that lives up in the second story there. No doubt he would welcome Casey with open jaws. A little stroll down the sidewalk.
doing some sniffing here by the back wall. What do you find there? What do you find in Casey? Kind of sad, but there's Rusty's grave. I gotta freshen up his tennis ball a little bit. Finding some good sniffing material here right by where the irrigation port enters the backyard. Pausing to catch our breath. Taking a full lap of the backyard. And now after a tiring adventure there's nothing better than a nice nap with your chili pepper and your psychedelic pillow. Sweet dreams, Casey.